Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here today. I'm Mary Angela Saavedra. I'm the director of the Center on the Hill. It is my great pleasure to welcome Jane Golden from Mural Arts Philadelphia here today to speak with us. Jane has been a driving force of Mural Arts Philadelphia since its inception. In partnership with innovative collaborators, she has developed groundbreaking and rigorous programs that employ the power of art to transform practice and policies related to youth education, restorative justice, environmental justice, and behavioral health. Sought after nationally and internationally as an expert on urban transformation through art, Golden has received numerous awards for her work. This year, she has been awarded the Jewish Family and Children's Service of Greater Philadelphia Honors Award and nominated as a 2022 Philadelphia Titan 100. She is an adjunct professor at the University of Pennsylvania and serves on the Mayor's Cultural Advisory Council and the Board of Directors of the Heliotrope Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Jane Golden. Very much. Hi everyone, how are you? Hi. Hope you're all having a nice day. So thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. So today we're going to do a couple things. One, um, we're going to talk about uh, uh, a little bit how I got involved in this profession. And then we're going to talk about all the work we're doing and then I'll leave time for questions. So, um, so our job at Mural Arts is to stretch art as far as we think it can go. And when we think we've gone far, we should go further. I feel that we have a huge responsibility on behalf of the citizens of the city to do right by them and to put art to work. I think that um, art can be useful and we're an organization that is highly, as you'll see in the images I show, we're highly practical, but also very aspirational. So in some way we sit at the nexus of the public, the private, the social, the civic, and the aesthetic. And people go, are you an art program? Are you education? Are you, you know, public safety? Are, you know, and, and the truth is, we're sort of all those things, but we look at the world through the lens of art. So um, my background is I grew up in Margate, New Jersey, and I uh, went to college in California at Stanford. When I graduated, I moved down to Los Angeles. And at the time, LA was like the center of the mural universe. There were just glorious murals all over LA. And I'm, I saw myself as an artist who would eventually become a lawyer. And so I, when I moved down there, I didn't think I'd paint murals, but I saw these murals and I was a painter. And so I ended up applying for a grant and I got it. Um, after calling them for like three months, I got this little grant to do this big wall and um, painting that mural in Santa Monica, I fell in love with mural making because of the way murals make art accessible to everyone. Like this morning, we had a mural dedication and standing in front of that wall in Strawberry Mansion um, and knowing we had worked with Horizon House. And so the people who worked on the project were, you know, had their struggles with substance use and yet they were able to overcome that to work with a team of artists to create something truly beautiful on 32nd Street. And there was something, there's something deeply inspiring about that. And I believe, you know, um, that art should be everywhere. Like I love galleries and museums. My mom was a very accomplished watercolor artist. So from the time I was young, I went to museums. But I just don't believe that art should reside exclusively behind those walls. I think that art is like oxygen. So when I started doing murals in LA, I found it really captivating. And I worked doing murals then for, for a number of years until I got sick, I had lupus. And I came back east, I came back here, and I started coming up to Philly to Hahnemann Hospital for treatments uh, for lupus. And as I was coming here, I was, um, I was reading about Philadelphia more, because I had been away for a while, and that Philadelphia had a new mayor, um, our first black mayor, Wilson Good, and that Philadelphia had a number of issues, and one of the issues was graffiti. And that the graffiti was, as it was being written about, like a social epidemic, it was everywhere, and mostly people thought it would never go away, so Wilson Good said that he was gonna create an anti-graffiti network where this organization would actually work with graffiti writers to make Philadelphia more beautiful. And so, in this one of the articles, Wilson Good said, it occurred to him that a lot of the kids loved art and he would create an art component. 
So I thought, well, you know, maybe that could be my job. So I um, wrote, I wrote a letter and I sent my resume to Wilson Good, expecting I would never hear from a big city mayor. And I ended up getting a call from a man who was his head of arts and culture, Oliver Franklin. And Oliver was like, well, I know your first boss in LA. And I called her about you. And she said, Jane Golden will drive you crazy. She's the most tenacious person I've ever met and you should absolutely hire her. So I was like, oh, phew. So then um, I went up to Philly. I interviewed for this job with the Anti-Graffiti Network. There's a little snapshot of Philly. And then here we are. <coughs> and after a few minutes, Tim Spencer was the director of the Anti-Graffiti Network. He said, well, if you want this job, you're hired. The salary is like $12,000 a year. And um, he said, we don't really know what to do with an artist, so your title will be field representative, which seemed a little strange, but what, I was like, okay, it's fine. And he said, and your job is to rechannel the negative energy of graffiti writers to something positive. So I was like, yeah, I just really wanted the job. So I was like, yeah, 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 I'll do whatever, whatever I have to do, I'll do it. And he said, and you can't, there's no desk for you. I was like, that's fine. Like, it's sort of odd. It was like, no desk. And then, yeah, it's like all these like things. But, but I was like, whatever. I'm, I'm like totally a flexible person. So then, suddenly, I did have this job, and I'd never met a graffiti writer, and so it was sort of like being an anthropologist, because I had to figure out why young people were writing on walls, and then what we could do to help reroute that behavior. So there were 12 community organizers, and then me, the art person, and it was our job to make Philadelphia better. And so, um, so here we are, Wilson Good, and that's the tea that so everybody. I love this picture because everyone looks so sort of unhappy because they're all <laughs> swearing that they won't write on walls for the rest of their lives, <laughs> which wasn't really true. But they would sign the pledge, and then they did scrub time, and then if they wanted to pursue art, they came to me. So I very quickly had to figure out like what to do. So I met graffiti writers, I talked to them, I figured out they had enormous talent, they didn't have opportunities, they had black books with these great drawings, they had been drawing from comic books since they were young, they loved abstract expressionism, they, they like, uh, yeah, they thought a lot about abstract art, Mark Rothko, William de Kooning, Hans Hoffman, I mean their knowledge was pretty broad, they loved Andy Warhol, they had lots of photos of Andy Warhol, their backpacks, the nice work. I was just like, what? Because it was almost like they had gone to college as art history majors, but they dropped out of high school. So I was like, look, this is such a big deal. You all could get paid to paint, because we had a big budget then that mostly went for kids. And I said, so you have to sign up, you have to do your scrub time, and then you can work with me. And I thought, well, what am I saying? What am I actually describing to them? So I'm like, well, we're going to do murals in the city. We're going to have art programs and do murals. So I called up the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I called up libraries. We set up these painting and drawing workshops and printmaking workshops everywhere. And then I knew they'd like mural painting because they thought, here they are. They are good wall hunters like me. They don't mind heights. They work out in all kinds of weather. And they love art. So I'm like, we will bond over this. So I showed them books of murals in LA, San Francisco, Chicago. And they like, were like, we could do that in Philly? I'm like, yes. And so at first they were like, well, we want to use spray. And I'm like, no, nope. Wilson Good says you can't use spray paint, you have to use a brush. They're like, okay, we're not signing up. So I'm like, okay, but I just want you to know you're walking away from a job, like a job. Like you can, you're gonna get paid to paint. Artists all over America would like that. And so they were like, well, maybe we'll, we'll think about it. So I said, okay, don't, don't think too long. So I tried not to be too heavy handed, but I really, like, really wanted to urge them to sign up. So finally, a lot of them did sign up and we started you know, doing murals. Every Saturday, we'd meet at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. We'd go to collections. Then we started going to New York. Museum of Modern Art, Metropolitan Museum. Their thirst to learn was really deep. And they um, really showed a lot of talent. So, but how do you, how did we get, like the mural components started, was that we would drive around neighborhoods, and we would, in Mantua, Mantua North Square and Strawberry Mantua, were the three areas we started. And we would say to people, we're with the Anti-Graffiti Network, would you like art on your wall? And people would say mostly, back in, back in the day, no, not really. I think we were really concerned about housing and jobs. And we would say, well, you know, art is not disconnected from the feel of a neighborhood. So what would you like? And people are like, well, 
not actually, no one ever asks us what we want. Things are done to us or not done. And the only visual stimulation we have here are billboards advertising alcohol and tobacco. We actually think that's a very interesting question. So we, would, we said, okay, what is it that you want? So in this neighborhood, the two community leaders, Tanisita and Iris, said, well, actually, the women in the neighborhood have been pushing the boulder up the mountain for years with not much resources, really transforming this community. We see them as heroes. So we were like, done. So every idea we heard, we, sort of, we did. Because really, what we were doing was building trust. We wanted people to have faith in us that we would listen to them. And that the art that happened was not art that was parachuted down from the sky. Like, think about it for a minute. We're in a city with a collection of public art, 4,300 indoor and outdoor murals. That's huge, right? right? And it's a collection that resonates with people, like that comes out of a process. Like today's mural was beautiful, astonishingly beautiful. But who worked on it? There were a lot of people who had some feedback. And if we hadn't done that, we would not have had a dedication with over 100 people standing there today cheering the mural. Just wouldn't happen. So that buy-in, that glue, started back in the mid-80s. And it was almost like looking at it through the lens of being a community organizer and going into communities with curiosity and with respect. And to not make the assumption, not make the assumption that somehow we knew better. And when we started doing murals, the biggest critics of the work were people who did not live in the neighborhoods. I remember my friend saying, well, why are you doing landscapes? I'm like, do you live at 20th and Diamond? And they'd be like, no. And I'd be like, that's none of your business, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean to be like sassy, but you know, whatever. I was like, and I go, no, no, we're gonna build trust. And so, and it really did as well because then people started talking to us about, well, what about the area in front of the mural? Well, could we connect with Philadelphia Green or the Horticultural Society? Could we think about other city services? And we were like, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. But the thing is, like we've made it through five mayors, and I'm gonna posit that um, the movement of muralism here in Philly has been so resilient because of the wide range of authors that are involved, that, that people have a stake in it. You have a stake in your destiny that matters. There's so many things that happen in our lives that are just, it's just out of our control. It is, but this should not be. People should feel that there is some thread that binds them to what is in the built environment of Philadelphia. And so it was thrilling and exciting to actually have these conversations in communities about aspiration and hope and dreams and then start to achieve it. So that people who felt a deep cynicism, nothing will change and it's rooted in reality. I got it, right? But that they were involved in creating the change. This wasn't about me. This wasn't my home. I didn't live there. I was a stranger. The first years in Philly, I didn't know Philadelphia. Thank goodness for the community leaders, for the block captains, for the young people that we work with. They were the team, right? And so um, here at, at this wall, people said, well, a group of women said, we've been to Mount Kilimanjaro. And that's our first, second, and third choice. So we were like, done, check. And we did it. And then people stop, stop saying, I'll meet you at 20th and Diamond. They said, I'll meet you at Mount Kilimanjaro. It's so nice. <laughs> and then we did the Dr. J mural, which was we got a grant from the, from the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts to do a figurative mural. And um, I had worked with this artist, Kent Twitchell, in LA. I assisted him on a 10-story mural, which was terrifying, but nevertheless gave me good experience. And we brought Kent here to do this mural. And this became like a beacon. So before we did this, this is, a, this is actually a good picture because we've got rid of all the graffiti on the wall. You can see it's a lot. And then you look at this transformation. This was painted in 1989. And this is what it looks like today if you went by there. So when we painted this, people said, there were so many cynics too back then. You're all wasting your time. It's a waste of taxpayers' dollars. The murals are going to get graffiti and the kids you're working with will just get, get in trouble again. And I'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's a lot of assumptions you're making. And again, is this your time or our time? So, oh, it's our time. So if we're wasting it, I guess we'll find out. But we actually believe that this is really, this is uh, time and money well invested. And I, I want to pause there for a minute because I want to talk about Wilson Hood. Um, because this to me was a very interesting model of government. Now Wilson Hood could have put money on the table to clean graffiti. 
you know, we have a CLIP program in the city. And you can actually give the CLIP program $20 million to clean graffiti. And I'm going to say to you, if graffiti is spiking high, like it was in the mid-80s, there's no way that's going to be back at graffiti writers. You have to reroute behavior. You have to work with the young people writing on walls. So that is very intuitive of Wilson Wood to do that. He also put a lot of money, $6 million, on the table to fund this program so that we could hire young people. Now think about it. A young person doing graffiti, they did scrub time, then they came in, and the seat of power was open to kids from all over the city, which is powerful. They started working very part-time, and they could work out to a full-time position. And eventually, over 10 years, we worked with 25,000 young people. 25,000. And because I know so many of them personally, I know that their lives were profoundly changed by this. Now, if we've gone in and said, guess what, everybody? We're going to do a four-week program. Like, congratulations for us for a four-week program. That's not working either. What worked was a sustained, substantive program over several years, and then kids grew up. Like, I'm continually confounded in the city about gun violence. I don't think gun violence is easy at all. I think it's hugely complicated, and it's the state and the federal government, and it a, needs a multifaceted approach. But I do feel like what Wilson Good did was he declared that he would have a massive jobs program, massive, and he never looked back for eight years. And that was a big deal. And so when people are sort of skeptical about government money, I'm like, no, government money is important. It's our social safety net. Like, who else was going to do this? A private business? No. And so, and when government money comes in, like if you look at Mural Lard's budget, 35% is from the city, and the rest we raise. And it's a lift to raise, but we're big leveragers. Public and private dollars make their way in every, almost every single thing we do. And we stir the pot, and we quadruple our work because of that. And I learned that back then. Government money, take it, raise a little money. And then when we became Mural Arts, we got even better at it. But anyway, so this is Dr. J. And then a little bit of behind the scenes. People always want to know how the murals happen. So we have our community meetings. We ask people what they're thinking. We work a lot on parachute cloth. That's the trick. People think we're painting directly on the walls, but three quarters of the murals are painted. It's a lightweight, um, non-woven material that we call parachute cloth, and it's very durable, and it means that everyone everywhere can help paint a mural. Like if, you go, if you all said we want to paint a mural, we would do a design, digitize the, digitize the image, and everybody could contribute. It's how we work in prisons and hospitals, senior centers. It's how we work in schools all over the city. And it makes it so the process is inclusive. And then we put it up. We get big boom lifts and scaffolding, and it's super complicated. And then the artist embellishes it. There we are embellishing it and putting up glass. And then I want to show you a few before and afters. So here's before in Nashua, and here's after. So you can see how transformative it is. And it often it isn't just a mural, it's connected to programming, it's connected to what's happening in front, like gardening. There's before, this is our re-entry program. Do this, we're transforming recreation centers with people coming home from prison and jails. It's a pretty big difference, right? It's a recreation center. Here we have a mosque, look at this, before and after. It's just like, it doesn't even, it's such a different building. And then before and after. Yep, and here's the basketball court, before and after, <laughs> which I think is so great. I know, I wish we could do this all over the city. There's no reason why we can't. We actually could. I mean, if we had the resources. <laughs> so, okay, so now I'm going to take you through the different divisions. So anyway, so fast forward to um, the late 90s, anti-graffiti closes down. My former boss passes away. And so I decided that I want to go to law school. So I applied to law school, I get into a couple of law schools, and my brother, who's a lawyer, said, well, I don't think you want to go to law school. And I was like, uh, really? And he said, yeah, you, sh you should run an art program for the city. So I said, well, but there isn't an art program to run. So he said, well, why don't you start one? So I said, what? He goes, why don't you go talk to Ed Randell? So I said, oh, well, that's interesting. So I went to see Ed Randell, and I said, well, a really sad anti-graffiti is closing, it closed down. And I'm thinking about going to law school. 
but I just thought I should come in here and talk to you about creating a community-based public art program, you know, based on what we did at Anti-Graffiti. So he said, well, far be it for me to talk someone out of being a lawyer, but I think it's a really good idea. And I was like, you do? And I was like, stop. And he goes, yeah, I do. So he said, well, where would you want to be in city government? So good thing for us, we had researched this. And we said, we'd like to work, then it was, this is before it was park and rec, it was just recreation. We said, we'd like to work at the Department of Recreation under Mike DiBerardinas, because we had researched him and we felt he would be a good, this would be a good home for us. And so he said, okay, I'll talk to Mike and I'll get back to you. So the following week, Edward Hill calls and he says, okay. Mike said, okay, so you should come up with a name for yourselves. So we're like shocked. And I'm like, I'm supposed to go to law school in September. So I, uh, so I'm like, so there are only a few of us left. There's a, a teacher who's like a co-director of the art unit with me. And then some of the kids who are now a little older. So we, we sort of huddle and then we say, we could call ourselves the mural arts program. And I said, okay, that sounds good. And so we go back to Edward and tell him, we go, okay, we'll be the mural arts program. So he goes, okay, Jane, you're in charge. So I said, I, I'm in charge. So he goes, you're, you're in charge and you should go over and meet with Mike DiBerardinas. So the five of us or six of us go meet with Mike. And he said, okay, well, welcome to the Department of Recreation. And we don't have space for you. Is a recurring theme with me and the desk. And I was like, I can't believe it. Like, I just have bad luck. So then I said, oh, he goes, well, we have an empty floor we can give you. So I'm like, oh, artists love empty floors. We'll take the empty floor. So in this, it's now the Phoenix, it's a fancy condo, but on the fifth floor, we had the whole floor. So we were like, this is so great. Oh my God, we're like in heaven with the empty floor. And we found some rickety furniture. We set ourselves up and we're like, we are the mural arts program. But we had like no money, right? We had like $100,000. So we were like, what are we gonna do? I thought, well, first, the thing I have to do is defer law school, so I did that. Then I noticed Mike DiBerardinas was raising private money to open up swimming pools. So I went to him, I said, can I do that? So he goes, sure, but you, you can't raise money and then it go, if it goes to the general fund of the city of Philadelphia, they're gonna make it, you donate the money to the general fund and then you'll never get it. So I'm like, oh, that's bad. So then, and then I talked to some colleagues because I just went through this leadership program, Leadership Philadelphia. They said, you have to form a board and a 501c3. Like, I don't think I could ever do this now, but somehow I got permission to do all of this. So we formed a board, like this leadership program, it was all divided up into tables. So everybody at my table, I called them and asked them to join my board. It was like, they were just like the lucky winners of being at the table with me. So I just went right around the circle. Will you join my board, will you join? They all said yes. So then I got a board chair. And then I'm like, okay, now, now I found a lawyer, a pro bono lawyer, and then we started raising private money. Because um, city council member, Happy Fernandez, I know some of you remember Happy, she sort of took us under her wing and she helped us raise private money. You know, like $1,000 here, $1,000 there. So every time we raise private money, I go to Mike and I go, will the city match it? And he goes, no, that's not really how it works. <coughs> Sorry, I have this nagging call. But the truth is, eventually, it was how the city worked. And we started raising more and more money, and we realized we're a pro-art program. We're not anti-anything. We can open our doors to all kids. We can work with emerging and established artists. And in some way, that was in 1998, we never looked back. So and over the years, the trajectory for us was good because when John Street came in to be mayor, his managing director, Estelle Richmond, she really liked mural arts, and she wanted us to have more city money and she was impressed at the way we had started leveraging it. And so um, it was clear to me, oh, this is like a winning formula to do this. And Estelle opened the door for us to work with kids who were truant, delinquent, work with major departments. She made us part of the division of social services. So suddenly, me, who I saw myself as quite low on the food chain in city government, I was at meetings with commissioners who were big thinkers and had giant budgets. And so I would just say to myself, you have to do everything you can to make friends with these people. Like follow them out, go in the elevator with them, hang around their office, like act, you know what I mean? Like be interesting. So, and then within six months, we started working with all these major departments. Because Estelle had the authority, the creativity, and the budget behind her to make this happen. So I feel like I could write a course on how to be effective in city government over so many mayors. So it's fascinating, this journey. So I'm gonna now tell you, talk, talk to you about the different departments of mural arts. Community murals, this is, so these are older murals. 
This is in Graysbury. Um, this is at 29th and Wharton, and we did this at a time when all communication in, in Graysbury had just shut down between blacks and whites, huge tensions, and we decided to do a peace mural, which everyone thought we were totally naive. And so I worked really hard with the deputy mayor, Lillian Ray. She's black, obviously I'm white. We were a team. We walked around, knocked on doors for a year. Some people slammed doors in our face, said, we're not talking to you. Other people said, we want to talk to you. And eventually, we got a consensus to do hands. These are real people's hands. My husband's a filmmaker. He snapped the picture. We digitized the image and projected on the wall at night. And then Meg Salomon came along and did this masterpiece at Broad and Spring Garden, which I'm sure some of you know. Um, it's really showed people that murals can be the same quality of art you see in galleries and museums. We put this in because this is right in Germantown by John Leidecker. Um, and community murals is the way that we respond to the city of Philadelphia. So people apply for murals, and we have a waiting list, and we you know, try to be as resourceful as possible with the funding, so we stretch it really far so we can accommodate more requests. And the requests are wide and vast and sprawling and wonderful and inspiring, and it's great and it's to, to hear what Philadelphians are thinking about. So here we have Joe Frazier by Ernel Martinez. This is Clay Gabriel. We also, an artist from Haiti, whose own work is so beautiful, and this was the first mural he did. And we employ about 225 artists a year. It's a very diverse group, um, and uh, most of the artists are local from Philadelphia, I'm proud to say. This is in Germantown, a new one. This is another one here. This one's on Freedom Theater uh, by Sean Theodore. I love this one, this is a historic building. And so we had our own, we could only work in the window area with the scrim. And uh, I just think this is a really interesting resolution. Now, Sean is a photographer, so we're not just working with painters now, but we're working with printmakers and photographers. And sometimes we just, we work with, we work with theater artists or dancers. It's very multidisciplinary now. And this one is the Freedom Fighters. I love this one as well because we were, the task was to do a portrait mural of Cecil B. Moore. And when we started studying Cecil B. Moore, we learned that he really inspired a generation of activists. So it was a question of how does one person, you know, really make a mark on the world because we think that everything should be generative. So he left this huge legacy, not only of his own personal actions, but on the people that he inspired. So we worked with the freedom fighters who are now in their 70s and 80s and still, you know, many of them doing great work. Um, and so this was by Felix St. Ford and Dave Tiberino. Um, and on the side of Gerard College. This one is on the side of the Kimmel. Not on the side, it's inside when you come in and you look up and there's this beautiful mural by Serena Saunders. And then we, you know, um, Ed Bacon designed the Thomas Rose in City Hall Courtyard and we're sort of um, the guardians of that space and we, every six, seven years, restore it and we just restored this recently. It looks so beautiful. And then we just worked with a group out of Penn State called the Colored Conventions. And the Colored Conventions group, they study um, 19th century black Philadelphia. And the Colored Conventions were really the forerunners of the NAACP. And a lot of giants, really just giants, came out of this movement. And so we did a series of projects that connect the work in the 1800s with activism going on today. And the scholars that we worked with were just incredible. And there is now there are now people in the school district who are working to get all this information into the curriculum so kids can study this. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And then we have an art education program. And so we have um, we serve a, a, a little over a thousand young people every year. And uh, it's really uh, a great program. We work after school, in the summer, and during the school day. And we do wonderful projects. It's project-based learning. We want young people to know they can have an idea, and we're going to support them and help them bring it to fruition. And this one was painted is by Michelle Ortiz, partly in Philadelphia and partly in Juarez, Mexico. And it was about the effects and impact of immigration. This is uh, by Wale. This is uh, Wale is and a fashion designer and a lawyer and an artist. And he did some artwork for, he did some fashion design for the movie Black Panther. And he lives in West Philadelphia. And he treated this project, he wanted the murals to look like Renaissance paintings. So we worked a lot with gold leaf paint. 
but when you look at who is in the mural, it's people from the neighborhood and the kids that we work with. And he also had uh, our kids do fashion design and to rethink school uniforms. <laughs> and this one is one of my favorites. This is the Amy Sherald mural. Amy Sherald did Michelle Obama's portrait. She's like a rock star in the art world now. And she was getting more and more famous as we were negotiating with her to do this project. And then she, she did Michelle Obama's portrait and we're like, oh my gosh, she's not, she's not gonna do this. But to her credit, she did not back out. She worked with our art education students. We took several hundred students to her studio in Hoboken. Um, it was great and exciting and they met Amy and curators and other artists, um, artists who look like the kids that we work with, which is super important. And this uh, young woman in the mural is one of our participants who had been in a program we have for kids aging out of foster care. It was a very, it was a really wonderful project and it put this young, this young woman in touch with her mom in that process, which was quite powerful. But um, as Amy was becoming more famous, she became pickier about the walls that she wanted. So we were driving around and driving around and every wall we showed her, she was like, nah, nah, that's not, a, we, she really wanted a vertical. So we parked for coffee. I said, well, let's just take a break and then we'll go out again. So we parked for coffee at 11th and Sansom and she looks up at this wall and she said, that's the wall I want. So I said, oh, well that is, that's owned by Target. I, I mean, they're based in like Minneapolis. I don't, I don't know that that's possible. And she said, well, I could call Michelle Obama. So I, said, oh. I was like, well, that would help. That would, I'm sure that would help. I'm like, a lot, a lot. Um, so then, um, I realized, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Target is a tenant, and I actually know the developer. So I said, okay, you don't have to call Michelle Obama. I think we can handle this at the local level. So um, I called the developer, and I just said, uh, John, um, this is Jane Golden, and I'm going to ask you a question, and you can't say no. Because <laughs> this artist is super famous, and we really want her to do a work in Philly, and the only wall she likes in the whole city belongs to you. So... <laughs> He said, okay, give me two weeks. And then he came back and said yes. And it was like a miracle. And so we did this project. And then we have a mural mobile that goes around. We mostly serve kids ranging in age between 11 and 18. The mural mobile means we can reach younger kids at parks and recreation centers all over the city. So every year we reach several thousand additional kids through this program. And then we work during the school day and we merge math, science, and art. This is about uh, global climate change. Lead artist Ben Volta, South Philly High. This is about art and activism. This is a very famous poet, Ursula Rucker. The kids designed a magazine, they did poetry writing, and then did this mural. We also do murals in schools. We think too many schools in the city look like prisons and they should be changed. And then Jess X. Snow is a well-known artist from New York. She did this um, and worked with, she also brought in writers, musicians, poets, and filmmakers. So the course for the kids was just fabulous. And then this is uh, Roberta Lugo, who is a, he is a ceramic artist from Kensington who is becoming very, very well known. He just did a big project at the Metropolitan Museum. And he is amazing. And he always talks about how when he was growing up, he didn't realize that he could be an artist. He thought that was for someone else. And he said he would draw from the murals in the city. I thought it was so interesting. And in his early 20s, he got up the courage to apply to Tyler. He got in, and it changed his life. And so um, he also, besides ceramics, he also can paint and design. And in the middle is Tariq Trotter, who is a member of the musical group The Roots. And Tariq, um, he credits Tariq and The Roots with really influencing music. And he's trying to do that with ceramics to make them more relevant. So he's on a mission. So the good. The, the great news about this project is Roberto, for two years, took kids to Tyler's campus to work with them. And then we just did a project with a collective out of Mexico City called Alumbra, where we did light sculpture. And then this is La Gloria Kenya. Um, this, this artist, Edgardo, is a, he created this very famous graphic novel where there's a young Latina woman who is a superhero fighting for environmental justice. So our kids designed their own graphic novel and then just did this mural. And this is called Flight. This is actually 18 stories tall. And the power here is that um, 
flight is a is a powerful metaphor in black literature as it's a metaphor standing for liberation and freedom and a flight towards justice. And Tatiana, the artist who painted this, started out with us when she graduated from University of the Arts 20 years ago. And we've seen her career grow and thrive. She's in New York now, and she's like a famous artist and came back, and we dedicated this mural um, two weeks ago. And one of the art ed students came up to speak, who's in a wheelchair, and she said that, um, she realized that the notion of flight is in one's mind and that she felt that she could fly. And so I feel that the impact of our work is on the wall in the community, but it's carried by every single one of our participants that we touch every year. And then our Porch Light program is our partnership with the Department of Behavioral Health. We work with people struggling with trauma, substance use, um, housing insecurity, we work with new immigrant communities and with veterans struggling with PTSD. So this is in the Northeast. We worked with an Iraqi artist, an American artist. This is Abdul, and Paul, Abdul um, and Paul did this one. It's beautiful. This one, um, we have a long-term uh, partnership with Einstein and we work with the psychiatric unit and people are providing lots of feedback and doing art over years that is, that is then um, we work with a master artist and it's on walls around the city in such a beautiful way. And then this is called the Trust Project. It's in Kensington. And Kensington, as you all know, is a community that is very free. And people tend to get angry with each other and not trust anyone. And so we worked with people throughout all of Kensington. And we wrote a series of crowdsourced poems. So we took words from everyone and we did tons of workshops. And we ended up creating this gazebo-like structure um, with words from the community in English and Spanish. And the thing is, this is in Harold Gate Park. And it's a park that was just not used very much until this project. And it created a sense of safety. And now, there's probably not a weekend in the nice weather where that park is not booked for an event. It's quite transformative. I you know, almost like I can't believe it, but it's true. And then we have another program called Color Me Back. It's our same day work program where people facing who are homeless or facing housing insecurity, they are paid for a morning's worth of work plus social services, plus we work with Career Link, and we are, and SEPT is our main partner and we're transforming the concourse and making it beautiful. And then we're working um, with uh, uh, the Asian American um, Pacific Islander group out of the mayor's office and the uh, Office of Immigrant Affairs. And we became part of the Stop Asian Hate movement uh, two years ago. And so we're doing a series of murals throughout the city. This was the first one. And this is on the site of Hardina, an Indonesian artist, Indonesian restaurant, worked with the Indonesian community. And it was just an incredible, extraordinary dedication to 250 people. I will say Pardina has delicious food, and that was a big draw for the dedication. <laughs> and this was um, about a welcoming mural to the trans community, and it's on the side of uh, Cape Life, which is this great bakery in Fishtown, and uh, Kaz, the artist, young artist, on their way up. This is by uh, Philip, Philip Adams, and this <coughs> is where we work with veterans, and you can see how interesting this is, because you can see the camouflage, right? But it's also a mural that's about welcoming people home. And then we have a new van in Kensington. We work intensively in Kensington. And this van will go everywhere from Covenant House to Prevention Point to schools to rec centers and bring art supplies and lots of welcome and love. And then here we are working in the concourse with Color Me Back. Just thought, these are brand new murals looking really beautiful. Beautiful. I mean, you know the concourse. You know how like it's like totally in need. I feel like we could work with SEPTA for the next hundred years and not run out of wall space. Restorative justice. Too many people are incarcerated in this country. We work in prisons and we work with people coming home. So here's some statistics. I want to draw your eye to the 8% recidivism rate. The national average is 65%. So as a country, we are failing. Failing. But so many people have creativity and talent. 
You know, I heard somebody speak recently, Ken Frazier, who used to be the CEO of Merck, and he said, um, there is no lack of talent. There is a lack of opportunity. And I completely believe him. Because when we started working in the state prison, probably 20 years ago, I went there with much trepidation. I'm ashamed to admit that I had a bias too, because we've mostly worked with young people, not adults. And I remember walking into this room and seeing these beautiful paintings and hearing the men say, you know, our lives went dark at age 10. And I thought, oh, I thought about the young people we worked with and the communities, and I thought about the toll that crime and violence takes. Um, there's a whole ecosystem that's destroyed when, when violence happens. And so it called us to lean towards our better angels of not judging, because really the people there had already been judged by a court of law and started to work in the prison. And that led to us working eventually in 2008 with people who were coming home and working in the Juvenile Justice Service Center for juveniles and really expanding our restorative justice work. And here's a mural. Actually, we did a series of murals with um, the men at Greaterford Prison and crime victims and victims advocates called Healing Walls. And then we have a fellowship program for artists who have been impacted by the criminal justice system. And this artist, uh, Russell Prey, there he is. He, we met him in prison. He was there for 12 years, and he got out, and he called us, and he went to our reentry program. And he's been out seven years, and in those seven years, he graduated from Bard College. His work is being collected by major collectors. You probably can't buy a painting of his for under $50,000. I mean, it's an extraordinary story. But it's not just Russell. There are many others. There's just an article in the New York Times that profiled seven artists. And five of the seven artists are artists that came through mural arts. Like, I was so proud. I was like, oh my god, that's amazing. Right? It's like worth that. It's like, yay. And this is Shepard Ferry. He did this. He did a series of projects about people who had been incarcerated, got out, and doing great things with their lives. And then the, the, the team, the restorative justice team, worked on this. It's a portrait of Octavius Cato, and they worked with scholars and printmakers. And then this one is brand new. This is by uh, Titus Gaffar, who's probably one of the most famous artists in this country, and Dwayne Betts, who had been in, incarcerated for quite a long time. And he got out and went to Yale Law School. And now he, and he's also a very famous poet. I think he's the poetry editor of the New York Times Book Review. Um, and he's building libraries and prisons across the country. So he is a busy bee. Um, and it was really a pleasure to, to meet him and work with him and have him go into our prison class. And then these are two walls that face each other <coughs> by Deb Willis, who heads the photography department at NYU, Michelle Jones, who had been incarcerated, got out, got her degree from NYU, and wanted to do her fellowship project with Deb Willis. And the same nine people, this is the nine people in their prison guard, this is the nine people, they're all real people in Philly, living their lives, giving back to the community. And it's called point of triangulation because there's one side, the other side, and the viewer. And the artists are asking us how we see people and can we suspend judgment. And then this one we worked on with the Guild. This is a mural that we did with Comcast in Center City. And then here we always have graduation ceremonies. We take them very seriously. A long time ago, our constituents said, we want caps and gowns, we want graduation music. We never had that experience. And we're like, oh, OK, we're definitely doing that. And we want a site of gravitas, so we always do it at City Hall. And then here is uh, some of our recreation center work, where we're transforming recreation centers over the summer. And then we have an environmental justice division, where we do, um, we're encouraging people to clean up Philadelphia through art. We're also transforming recreation centers and the ground around it. We have Trash Academy, where we go out and we talk to people about the many ways that they can help clean up the city. We also have um, these transformative projects on schools where we're not just doing murals, but also the school grounds. This mural is 28,000 square feet. It's in English and Spanish. And then we had a big festival about climate justice. Our Mural Arts Institute is where we work with cities from all over the country and the world, building capacity. It's like a knowledge exchange, because we always think about the field of art and social practice. 
we're busy bees there, and here we are. And we just started a program in Athens, and then we do trainings, we have symposiums, here we are working in Austin. Just some images from around the country. And then special projects. You see we do overpasses with this monument lab where we challenge Philadelphians to think about what is an appropriate monument for the current city of Philadelphia. Hank Willis Thomas to the Afro pick. At the Municipal Services Building, we do indoor work. This is at the rail park. We do the oval. This is our art at the Browning, beautiful artist at Fifth and Spring Garden. This is our eco mural by Kala Hogopian. This we just dedicated last week um, to Sean Theodore. This is a tribute to Judge Higginbotham, an unsung hero. We have every few years we do a Biennale with many artists coming to Philadelphia. We did this 24 story mural by Momo. We also do a lot of work. As I said before, with new immigrant communities, the bus went up and down the 47 route. On the back it said, oh, we are all migrating together. We did 50 second story walls that you can see only from the L train by an artist who used to be a graffiti writer, and now he's a very famous artist, Stephen Powers. This is Katerina Grossa, a Berlin-based color artist who did seven miles of color with us along the Amtrak corridor. This is by J.J. Tzu about the dancer and all of us at the Philadelphia airport, 85,000 square feet. We work with the Eagles every year and we transform a school and build a playground. This is by Rebecca Rudstein. This is by uh, the South Street Bridge, beautiful. We have an artist in residency program in the DA's office, this is James Howell. And we're building a floating laboratory performing art space at Bartram's Garden. It is called Float Lab. It is designed by Lee Jin Yoon, who is the head of the architecture department at, at, at um, MIT. There's nothing like it in the country. By day, it will be a place where young people can study the river, sustainability, environmental justice, all kinds of environmental issues. At night, it will be a point for meditation, and we will be able to have um, lots of performing arts people perform there. I love the fact that it's in southwest Philadelphia, an area that has been historically um, underappreciated or served over the last many years in our city. And that is it. So when you ask what our work is about, it's about impacting individuals, communities, and by extension, this entire city. Um, and we always say at Mural Arts that art ignites change. And the privilege of this job, the real privilege of it, is that we get to see that transformative power of art at work every single day. Thank you. Like if it's the Guild, our reentry program, you could have 30 people in shifts working on big projects. Or you could have a smaller team. But there's always a team. Every year we work with about 25,000 people, all told. Community people and all our participants. So it's a big, it's a big. Do you ever do senior centers? Senior? We have in the past, and we like that. Yeah, we're very interested. Yes? your murals on, on material, is that correct? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then put it on the wall. Correct. And now, this is enabling you then to restore it in the future if, if it's necessary? Well, interestingly enough, that technique, we put on the cloth with three coats of acrylic gel, and it's on for good, so it does not come off. It is really serves the test of time. But um, some artists are old-fashioned, and they'll still work directly on the wall. So a quarter of the murals are right on the wall, and others are we work with parachute cloth. But we do have a mural restoration program. We start, we're trying to raise more funding for it, because we feel we are definitely responsible for the collection of art in our city, and we want to make sure the work is preserved. Other questions? Don't be shy. How, what's the total number of murals? 4,300. 
<laughs> in our city, yes? Do you have a book? Yes, we have three mural books. Oh. Oh. If you go to our website, muralarts.org, we have um, two coffee table mural books and then one that's called Mural Arts at 30 that's a wonderful collection of essays. It's great. And we also have a tour program. If you're interested in tours, we have yeah. walking tours and trolley tours. Yeah. Where do you get the trolley tour? Pardon me? Where do you get the trolley tour? Oh, it meets at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art. Oh. And I, I'll have some brochures I'll leave here, and I'll leave my card also so in case you want more information. Thank you. Oh, great. So this table's had a lot of questions. Anyone else? <laughs> no? No, I just want to say thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, we, I love the work. It's really, like, inspiring. Yeah, I moved to Philly in 89, and I've been kind of following the miracles. Oh, that's great. Yay! Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Can I do the advertisement? Sure. This is on the website. Oh. Okay. Oh, yes. Thank you. Oh. Yay. There's a t-shirt, too. What else at home? It's one of the murals, though. <laughs> and they have umbrellas, and the merchandise is great. Yeah, bags. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Think about it for the holidays. They're very unusual gifts. <laughs> You're right. The umbrella is beautiful. It's beautiful. If, if you volunteer, do you have to be really talented? No. We have community days, and you can help get the cups to people, get paper towels. No, no. We, we, we're really happy for volunteers. Uh, so, like, go first. Okay. But you're in the action. So right. You're in the action. Yeah. 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 And also, people who are helping to paint the mural, you don't have to have a lot of experience. I mean, the artist, once it goes up on the wall, they embellish it. Oh. Like, the mural we did connected to the Pope's visit had 7,000 people work on it. Is in the Guinness Book of World Records, actually. They came with confetti and a bell. It was a big deal. Um, so, um, but yeah, so Cesar, the artist, he, he fixed it up. So anyway, oh, yes. Because the last time I saw you, I had taken three trolley tours. And the one that impressed me most, most was the people that painted uh, from Greater for Prison. And we actually got out and looked, and they discussed the, the mural and how they painted it. But they were given sections of paper right. in, while they were in the prison. That's exactly right. We give them sections of the parish cloth. Right. So they and didn't get out of prison. What they used to do, <coughs> sorry, it's, we're, in, uh, we're working in a different prison. So we used to have, be in this auditorium, and the men would tape the squares together so they could see the mural before we took it out. Oh, nice. And we take pictures of it so they can see the dedication. Oh, yeah, they do a number of big projects every year. Oh. And what's really nice is that um, some of the juvenile lifers got out because of the Supreme Court ruling. And they're all doing really interesting things. And now a few of them are mentors in our program. So That's it's like, wonderful. yeah, it's been really nice to see. What a, what a positive. So we're trying to make the city a better place. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.